Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that reminders benefits believers. So there's a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, in which he says, Mamin Ayamin Ahabu ilallahi and you ta'abada lahu fiha min ashri dil hija, O Kamakala alayhi salatu wa salam. He says, There are no days more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he be worshipped in them than the ten days of Dul Hijjah. And this is mentioned in multiple books of Bukhari and Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah. And if you notice the phraseology that he uses, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, Mamin Ayamin. So this denotes a very, very strong negation that there are no days whatsoever, not even the days of Ramadan, according to many, many ulama, that are ahabu. Ahabu in grammar is called an elative of comparison. Of course, this word ahabu is related to the word hub, which means love. There are no days more beloved to Allah than the ten days of Dhul Hijjah. And when something is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the believers must play, pay close attention. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he doesn't say here, uh, you know, acceptable to Allah or pleasing to Allah or appreciated by Allah. He says, beloved to Allah. Like he says in another hadith, ahabu biladi illallah masajiduha, o kama qala, that the most beloved of places to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the masajid. Now we know that. But many of us don't know what month or even year it is, according to the Islamic calendar, let alone specific days. So not all days are the same. Not all days are created equal. We must be cognizant uh, of that. If we have a deadline due for work, we're very, very cognizant of that deadline. It's in the back of our mind. We keep looking at it on our calendar. And that's for our work. So we should be at least equally cognizant of days that are especially described as being beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, what about the Quran? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَوَاعَدْنَا مُوسَى ثَلَثِينَ لَيْلَةً وَأَتْمَمْنَا هَا بِعَشْرٍ فَتَمَّ مِقَاتُ رَبِّهِ أَرْبَعِينَ لَيْلَةً Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we appointed for Musa alayhi salam 30 nights and we completed them with 10 more. Thus the appointment of his Lord was complete as 40 nights. So Imam al-Tabari and Imam al-Zamakhshari and many, many other mufassirin or exegetes of the Qur'an, they say that the 30 here, the thalathin, actually refers to the entire month of Dhul Qa'da, which is the 11th month. And the final 10, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, atmamna habi ashrin, this ashr refers to, this 10 refers to the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. In other words, the revelation of the Torah was completed on Turi Sinin, on Mount Sinai, in Dhul Hijjah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath in the Quran. He says, Wal Fajr, Walayal in Ashr, Wal Shafi, Wal Watar. By the dawn, by the ten nights, and by the even and the odd. Many exegetes of the Quran say here that the ten nights mentioned here are the ten nights, the first ten nights of the month of Dhul Hijjah, and that the even, a Shafi, Right? Wal Fajr, Wal Ayan, and Ashr, Wal Shafi, Wal Watar. Wal Shafi means the even. They say that this refers to Eid al Adha, which is also called Yom al Nahar, the day of sacrifice, which is the 10th of Dhul Hijjah, which is tomorrow. 10 is an even number, obviously. While the Watar, Wal Shafi, Wal Watar, the odd, refers to Yom Arafah, the 9th of Dhul Hijjah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by this, and we know that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath, a qasim by anything, then that thing is truly great. In fact, the Prophet sallallahu he says, ma min yawmin, using the same type of phraseology, ma min yawmin akthara min an yu'tiqallahu fihi abdan min an nar min yawmi arafa, o kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam, that there is no day when Allah sets free more servants from the fire than the day of Arafah. And then he continues, says something incredible, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws near to his servants and praises them to the angels and says to them, Ma arada ha'ula'i, what do these people want? This hadith is in Muslim. Now obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows what we want. The point of the hadith is to create in us a desire to ask him, what do these people want? So. What are the people doing then? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking the angels, what do these people want? What are the people doing? They're obviously asking Allah for things. They're making dua. And dua is a very important 
part of our spirituality. In fact, the Prophet وسلم, he said, a dua mukhul ibadah. This hadith is in Bukhari. Dua is the essence of worship. He said, Laysa shay'un akramu. Laysa shay'in akrama ala Allahi. Akrama ala Allahi min dua. This hadith is in Tirmidhi. That there is nothing more uh, honored to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than dua, supplication. And the ulama say there's two reasons for this. Number one, it fulfills the command of Allah in the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, Ud'uni astajib lakum. Call upon me so that I might answer you. And number two, it establishes a very personal, intimate relationship between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the supplicant, the Rabb and the Marbub, the Lord and the servant. The Prophet sallallahu had a very intimate relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the point where he would stand and worship hatta tadima qadamah, until his feet would be swollen. And when he was asked about that, he said, afala akunu abdan shakura. Shall I not be a grateful servant? He's worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes we read the Quran uh, and we don't understand the nuances of classic Arabic or we read a translation and the translation is not very good, very stilted, kind of old-fashioned. But there are places in the Quran that are, that are incredibly, incredible how they describe the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes his relationship with the Prophet sallallahu For example, there's an ayah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks directly to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, Fasbir, uh, Fasbir hukmi rabbik, fa innaka bi a'yunina. And some of the translations, they just, it sounds like King James translated this. Like, uh, you know, uh, so be patient as to the coming of the command of thy Lord, for verily thou art in our eyes. What does that mean? I asked one of my teachers, what, is, what does this mean? And the way that he translated it to me in English was, this is the gist of it. It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is saying to the Prophet, relax, I love you. Relax, I love you. That's the meaning of it. In dua, you can speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your own words, in your own language, in love, longing, and hope. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِذَا سَعَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ when my servants ask you, this ka, the khitab is the Prophet When my servants ask you concerning me, indeed I am close to them. Allah is qareeb. And this closeness, this qurba of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in knowledge, awareness, and concern. It has nothing to do with space or physicality because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is transcendent over physicality. Allahu mawjudun bila makan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists uh, without any type of physical space or, or spatial concerns or physicality. In fact, the Prophet وسلم, he said, The closest a servant is to his Lord is when that servant is in sajda. So this has nothing to do with physical space or distance. Closeness in a relational sense. I answer... I respond to the supplication of the supplicant whenever he calls upon me. Sometimes you hear somebody say, well, my du'as are never answered. Right? There's a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim <clears throat> with the Prophet wasallam. He said, your prayers are answered as long as you do not become impatient. Your prayers are answered as long as you do not become impatient. Ajlan. And the Sahaba asked him, who is the impatient one? And he said, the one who says, Da'autu Rabbi falam yastajibli. The one who says, I made supplication to my Lord and he never answered me. Right? So he's breached adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's important that we have a good opinion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we have husnu dhan billah. This is very important. According to our theology, when you make dua, one of three things will happen. Either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you what you want in the dunya, or he won't give you that thing, but he'll give you something better. And sometimes we don't know that what he's given us is better because Allah is al-hakim, he is wise. Allah has ilm mutlaq, he is omniscient, he knows the future, but we don't know that. So we complain if we don't get exactly what we want. Or this also entails that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deprive you of something, but by depriving you of that thing, he averts you from a musibah that could have destroyed you. 
Or the third thing will happen, which is the best, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't give you anything in the dunya, but on the yawm al-qiyamah, you'll see the reward of that dua in the form of jibal, mountains. And people will see these mountains, and they will wish, I wish, I, I wish that Allah never accepted a single one of my adi'iyah in the dunya, because I could have these mountains. So the akhirah is better. وَالْدُّحَا وَالْلَيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى مَا وَدْعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَالَى وَلَا الْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى The afterlife is better than the, the present. Ibn Ata'illah, he said, if Allah gave you the treasure of being able to make dua, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the treasure of being able to make dua, he said, even raising your hands to him, then know that he'll give you whatever you ask him. Of course, with the condition that you have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibrahim ibn Adham was a little more strict. He was uh, a great zahid from the tabi'een. His students came to him and said, why doesn't Allah answer our prayers? And he says, you read the Quran, but you don't implement it. You claim to love Allah, but you don't implement the injunctions. You claim to love the Prophet sallallahu but you don't follow him. How can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answer your dua? You don't follow the Habib of Allah. You're asking Allah for things, but you don't follow his Habib, his beloved. How can Allah answer your dua? I remember back in the, the day, as they say, I used to play a little flag football. And we were in a flag football league, and the league was basically all Muslim. And, uh, and uh, we got to the championship game one year. And so our team and the, and the team were going to play we prayed Asr together. and Everyone was there praying Asr, and after Asr, people were making dua. I'm like, well, mashallah, very religious people here. And then we, pray the we, we played the championship game, and my team lost, and now it's Maghrib time, and almost everyone from my team is walking away, and the other team is praying Maghrib. So I asked one of my teammates, <laughs> I said, where are you going? Didn't you pray Asr? And he said, we lost the game. This was his response. I said, what? And he said, yeah, in my dua after Asr, I asked Allah to give us victory. He didn't. Why should I pray to him? This was his response. SubhanAllah. I said, yeah, with an attitude like that, no wonder why we lost the game. So dua is the essence of worship and the most honored of things. Now, in addition to this, the Prophet Sallallahu he said, Afdalu dua, dua yomi arafah. That the greatest dua is the dua on the day of Arafah. This is in the Muwatta of Imam Malik. So this is the time right now to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what you want. Ma arada ha'ula'i. Allah is asking the angels this moment, what, what do they want? Fama nurid. So what, what do we want? So there'll be a time for you to make private dua, inshallah ta'ala, uh, today. But let's uh, read now, corporately, together, some of the ad'iyya in the Quran itself. Because the best of speech is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran actually uh, gives us the words as to what to say. Allah taught us how to make dua. All we have to do is say them, right? It's like a, a professor giving you the answers to the test and saying, just come to the test day and fill in the blanks. So the following are most of the ad'iyya that begin with a vocative, Rabbana. Rabbana means, oh, our Lord. Is a very personal address. That's why I chose these. A very personal address to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because your Lord, your Rabb, is the one who takes care of you. It denotes the imminent deity, the God that is close to you, the God that is qareeb, he's close. There's qurba, there's imminence. You probably so know some of these, or most, or even all of these, ad'iyya, but might not have reflected upon their meanings. So the first one is in Surah Al Baqarah, it's very well known. Rabbana atina fid dunya. And interestingly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He says that there are some people who stop here. Rabbana atina fid dunya. Full stop. He says this in the Quran. And He says, Wa ma lahu fil akhirati min khalaq. And they have no portion in al akhirah. Because they want the dunya, that's what they're going to get. Rabbana atina fid dunya hasana. Wa fil akhirati hasana. Wa qina adhab al nar. Qul ameen. I mean, oh, our Lord, give us good in this world and good in the afterlife, in the akhirah, and save us from the fire. The next one is the dua of the army of Dawood, alayhi salam. And this is a dua you can make 
you should make when you face a tremendous challenge like his army did. رَبَّنَا أَفْرِغْ عَلَيْنَا صَبْرًا وَثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَنَا وَانْصُرْنَا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ قُلْ أَمِينَ أَمِينَ O oh, our Lord, bestow upon us patience. وَثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَنَا is metaphor. Literally means plant our feet, feet firmly. It means give us istiqama, uprightness in the deen. Fortify our faith. And give us victory over the unbelievers. And victories of different types, physical, moral, and spiritual. The next one is from Khawatim al Baqarah, the very end of Surah al Baqarah. Imam al Suyuti says that the end of Surah al Baqarah uh, was revealed to the Prophet وسلم, through direct discourse, what's called interior locution, without angelic mediation. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed these ayat directly into the heart of the Prophet. وسلم, Without the agency of Jibreel alayhi salam, when he was at the Sidratul Muntaha, Lilatul Isra wal Mi'raj. Rabbana la tu akhidna in nasina o akhta'ana. O our Lord, do not take us to task if we forget or make mistakes. Rabbana wala tahmil alayna isran kama hamal tahu ala ladina min kablina. O our Lord, do not lay upon us a burden like you laid upon those before us. رَبَّنَا وَلَا تُحَمِّلَّا مَا لَا تَاقَتَنَا بِهِ O oh, our Lord, do not impose upon us what we do not have the strength to bear. وَعْفُ عَنَّا وَاغْفِرْ لَنَا وَارْحَمْنَا I love that part. وَعْفُ عَنَّا And pardon us. So Allah is al-'afu. Afu means the one who forgives the sin and then erases every trace of the sin. It's obliterated, gone completely. وَعْفُ عَنَّا وَغْفِرْ لَنَا And forgive us. Allah is Al-Ghafir, Al-Ghaffar, Al-Ghafoor. All of these mean forgiving. وَرْحَمْنَا And have mercy upon us. Have compassion for us. Allah is Rahman Rahim. أَنْتَ مَوْلَانَا فَانْصُرْنَا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ You are our master. So give us victory over the unbelievers. Ameen. The next one is very crucial nowadays. رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِغْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبَ لَنَا مِنْ لَنُنْكَ رَحْمَةً إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَاب O oh, our Lord, do not cause our hearts to waver after you have guided us and bestow upon us from your own self a special mercy. Verily, you are the bestower of gifts. رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ جَامِعُ النَّاسِ لِيَوْمِ اللَّهُ رَيْبَ فِي إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُخْرِفُ الْمِعَادِ أمين. The next one is the prayer of the disciples of Isa alayhi salam. رَبَّنَا آمَنَّا بِمَا أَنزَلْتَ وَاتَّبَعَنَا الرَّسُولَ فَكْتُبْنَا مَعَ الشَّاهِدِينَ O oh, our Lord, we have believed in what you have sent down. And they were talking about the Injil, we were talking about the Quran and all of the Kutub. وَاتَّبَعَنَا الرَّسُولَ And we follow the Messenger. So record us among the witnesses. Ameen. The next dua is the dua of the Ulul Albab. The people of Lub, the people of core essential understanding of the religion, the people of deep understanding. Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batila. O our Lord, you did not create this in vain. So this creation has a purpose. There's, there's a telos, there's an end to this creation. Uh, things are Created things are signs, ayat, of the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are some people who believe that all of this is meaningless, random, matter in motion. It doesn't mean anything. O oh, our Lord, you did not create this in vain. Subhanaka faqina adab nar Glory be to you. Save us from the torment of the fire. Rabbana innaka man tudkhilin nara faqad akhzayta. O oh, our Lord, whoever you cause to enter into the fire, you have disgraced. وَمَا لِلْظَالِمِينَ مِنْ أَنصَارِ And for the oppressors, there is no help. رَبَّنَا إِنَّنَا سَمِعْنَا مُنَادِيًا يُنَادِي لِلْإِيمَانِ O oh, our Lord, indeed we have heard the, the caller call to us. Who is the munadi? Is the Prophet Wasallam? Call us to faith, saying, أَنْ إِنُوا بِرَبِّكُمْ Telling us to believe in our Lord. فَآمَنَّا So we have believed. رَبَّنَا فَاغْفِرْ لَنَا ذُرُوبَنَا O oh, our Lord, forgive us our sins. وَكَفِّرْ عَنَّا سَيِّئَاتِنَا And absolve us our evil actions. وَتَوَفَّنَا مَعَ الْأَبْرَارِ And cause us to die with the pious. 
give us husn al khatima a good ending rabbana wa atina ma wa'adtana ala rusulika wa la tukhzina yawm al qiyamah innaka la tukhlifu al mi'ad O oh, our Lord, give us what you promised us through your messengers and do not disgrace us on the day of resurrection. Verily, you never break your promise. Amin. The next one is the supplication of Adam and Eve, which really shows the difference between the Adamic and the Satanic paradigm. Right? Satan, he, he just blames Allah for everything. Fabima Ahwaitani. Oh, this is because of what you did to me. It's all you. Whereas Adam and Eve, in this du'a is in the plural, رَبَّنَا ذَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِن لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُنَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ O oh, our Lord, we have wronged ourselves. And if you don't forgive us and show mercy, then indeed we'll be from the losers. Amin. The next one is the prayer of Bani Israel while being oppressed by the Pharaoh. رَبَّنَا لَا تَجْعَلْنَا فِتْنَةً O oh, our Lord, do not make us a tribulation for oppressors. Save us by your mercy from the unbelievers. The next one is the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Rabbana ghfir li wa li walidayya wa lil mu'minina yawma yaqumu al-hisab. Ameen. O oh, our Lord, forgive me and my parents and the believers. Uh, uh, on the day of reckoning. The next one. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata a'yun wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama. Amin. O oh, our Lord, bestow upon us spouses and children that will be a comfort to our eyes, the coolness of our eyes, and make us leaders for the God-fearing. Next one is the dua of those who became Muslim after the Hijrah, which includes all of us. Rabbana ghfir lana wa li ikhwanina alladhina sabakuna bil iman wa la taj'al fi qulubina ghillan lilladhina amanu. Rabbana innaka raufur rahim. O oh, our Lord, forgive us and our brethren who, brethren who preceded us in the faith. And do not put in our on the day of Arafah is what I and the prophets before me have said. La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah lahul mulku wa lahul hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. This is the best invocation for today, Yomi Arafah, which is one of the most blessed days uh, according to the Islamic calendar. There is no God but Allah. He is one. He has no partner. To him belongs the dominion, to him belongs all of the praise, and he has over all things power. So in addition to dua, one of the best things you can do today is fasting. And according to the Hanafi school, fasting on Yomi Arafah is a sunnah mu'akkada, which means a highly emphasized sunnah. The hadith of the Prophet وسلم, is in Sahih Muslim. Su'ila an sawmi yawmi arafa. Qala yukaffiru sanat al maldiya wal baqiya. Aw kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. He was asked about fasting on the 9th of Arafah. It's obviously for people that are not uh, Hajj. And he said that it is an expiation for the sins of the previous year and the coming year. So, why are these days so blessed? Why are these days so blessed? So these are the days of the Hajj, the pilgrimage. And the pilgrimage harkens back to the very primordial origins of our deen, 
The rights of the Hajj go back to our Master Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجْ Call people to the pilgrimage. Ibrahim alayhi salam, a man whose very name in the Hebrew language, Abraham, means the father or patriarch of many nations. A man who was revered and loved by over three billion human beings on planet Earth. So Eid al-Adha is a commemoration of our master Ibrahim alayhi salam. It is kind of our origin story. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he's called the friend of God, Khalilullah, in the Quran. He's called the friend of God in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. He's called the friend of God in the New Testament. In all three books, all three scriptures, he's called the friend of God. This is a man who was known as the great iconoclast, the breaker of idols, the man who was called the Imam of mankind, inni ja'iluka linnasi imama, the one about whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذْ جَاءَ رَبَّهُ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ that he brought to his Lord a sound heart, a heart free of spiritual maladies and diseases, the one about whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ إِبْرَهِيمَ كَانَ أُمَّةٍ Ibrahim was a nation unto himself. Qanitan lillah, devoted to Allah. Hanifan, the primordial and quintessential monotheist. Walam yakumin al mushrikeen, and he was not an idolater. So the centrality of the Abrahamic tradition is very clear in the Quran. The Quran says that they say, Kunu hudan aw nasara, tahdadu. They say, become Jews or Christians if you want to be guided. What is the response? Qul bal millati Ibrahim hanifa wa makana min al mushrikeen. Say to them, no, I'd rather follow the tradition of Ibrahim, the quintessential monotheist. He did not associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ma kana Ibrahim yahudiyan, wala nasraniyan, wala kin kana hanifan, muslima, wa makana min al mushrikeen. Ibrahim alayhi salam was not a Jew or a Christian, a Christian, but a quintessential monotheist and a Muslim in the literal sense. You see, it's anachronistic to call Ibrahim alayhi salam a Jew or a Christian. These terms are later. They are tied to specific people. Judaism after Judah, Yehuda, one of the sons of Yaqub alayhi salam, right? One of the progenitors of Bani Israel. And of course, Christian from Christos in Greek after Christ. But Islam and Muslim as a trans chronic concept that uh, certainly existed at the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam. This is what the Quran is drawing our attention to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul Allah. Say Allah speaks the truth. Fattabi'u millati Ibrahim hanifa wa makana min al-mushrikeen. Have ittiba' of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ittiba' means to adhere to him, follow upon his footsteps. Now in another ayah in the Quran, famous ayah, Ayatul Imtihan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Tell the people, O Prophet, if you really love Allah, then you have to follow me. And it's the same verb, ittiba'. So in one ayah, Allah says, have ittiba', follow Ibrahim alayhi wa sallam, the tradition of Ibrahim alayhi wa sallam. In another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the exegetes deduce from this that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is upon that primordial Abrahamic path. And in fact, this is exactly what the Quran says. إِنَّ أَوْلَى النَّاسِ بِإِبْرَاهِيمُ لَلَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوا Indeed, the closest of people to Ibrahim alayhi salam are those who follow him. وَهَذَا النَّبِيُّ As are this Prophet. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاللَّهُ وَلِيُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ so the Prophet Sallallahu is the great restorer of the Millah, the tradition and creed of Allah's Khalil. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu restored and perfected the Millah, the deen uh, of Ibrahim Alayhi Salam. This is why he is Habibullah. In fact, the Prophet Sallallahu said in the Hadith in Tirmidhi, he said, Ra'aytu Ibrahim. He said, I, I saw Ibrahim Alayhi Salam. This is on the night later to Isra wal Mi'raj. And he said, فَإِذَا أَقْرَبُ مَنْ رَأَيْتُ بِهِ شَبْهًا صَحِبُكُمْ He said, the one, that looks, the one that resembles him the most is your companion, meaning himself. 
So the Prophet ﷺ resembled Ibrahim ﷺ, ظاهراً وباطلاً. Even physically, he resembled Ibrahim ﷺ. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet ﷺ on the day of Arafah, the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, during the final pilgrimage, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا. This day I have perfected your religion for you, completed my favors upon you, and I'm pleased uh, for Islam to be your deen, your religion. There's a hadith in Bukhari that says a Jewish man uh, came to Sayyidina Umar and he said to him, if that ayah was revealed to us, we would have made that day a day of Eid. And Sayyidina Umar said, Qad arafna yom wal makan nazalat fihi ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa We know the time and place this ayah was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu it was revealed to him at Arafah on the day of, on Friday, on the day of Jum'ah. Of course, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, when he heard this ayah, he began to weep because he knew that this meant that the Prophet ﷺ was going back to his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does this perfection and completion refer to that this ayah speaks of? Al-yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati. There's ikmal in itmam. There's perfection and completion. Uh, some of the ulama say that this is indicative that this is the final portion of the Quran revealed to the Prophet ﷺ. Imam Suyuti, he surveys several ulama in his seminal text called Al-Itqan, the Ulum al-Quran. And he says that while that might be true with respect to the ahkam, the legal injunctions of the Quran, there are no more legal injunctions after this point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still continued to reveal Quran to the Prophet sallallahu praising the Prophet sallallahu as well as reminding people of the Yawm al-Qiyamah. There is a strong opinion that the final ay the final portion, period of the Quran revealed to, uh, to the Prophet sallallahu is the very end of Surah At-Tawbah. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ it's a beautiful description of the Prophet ﷺ. There is probably even a stronger opinion that the very last ayah revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, revealed to him just a few days before his passing is ayah 281 of Al-Baqarah. For the note takers, 281 of Al-Baqarah. وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ ثُمَّ تُوَفَّ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا كَسَبَتْ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ Fear the day upon which you will be returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will be repaid. Every soul will be repaid for what it did and no one will be wrong. So the Quran, the Quranic revelation in the early days in Mecca, it began with Descriptions of the Yawm Al-Qiyamah, Al-Qari'ah, Al-Haqqah. These are describing Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And it ends with a description or a reminder of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. This is called, in rhetoric, this is called a concentric composition. And the Quran is concentric. This is a, an element of its i'jaz, its inamenability. This, this is a, an, a, an aspect of how it's impossible to imitate the Quran that flies way over the head of a lot of people takes deep structural analysis. Yet according to other exegetes, this perfection and completion, this ikmal and this itmam, refers to the establishment of the rights and procedures of the final Muslim ritual obligation, the final pillar, hajju baytillah, pilgrimage to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that the mushrikeen are decisively barred from making the hajj. Such is the importance of the Hajj. It perfected and completed the religion. It brings us back to Ibrahim alayhi salam. The Prophet sallallahu said, whoever performs the Hajj for Allah without engaging in inappropriate talk and transgression, raja'aka yawman waladatu ummu, will return like the day his mother gave birth to him. This is in Bukhari and Muslim. You will become a born-again Muslim, to use a Christian term. Now, given the high status of Ibrahim alayhi salam in our deen, it pains me to say that 
mainstream media, especially Hollywood, as well as the ever-increasing monoculture of the academy, the colleges and universities, by and large have declared open ideological warfare on Abrahamic tradition and Abrahamic morality. They're not shy about it. It's open. It's brazen. And if you don't know that this is happening, then you've been asleep. And I encourage you to watch a lecture I gave sitting right here about two years ago on postmodernism. The dominant epistemology in Western Academy is called postmodernism. It's important for us to know what that is. To make a long story short, college students are constantly told by their social science professors that traditional value systems are inherently oppressive because they are hierarchical. There's a hierarchy, and they're patriarchal. They love this word, patriarchy. Some even say that before these oppressive Abrahamic religions existed, the world was the, you know, this utopia of peace and justice. It is a total false narrative. This is postmodern philosophy. It rejects ultimate and absolute truth. They say there's no absolute truth. There's no such thing as the truth. There's no such thing as al-haq. This is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qul al-haq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was ordered by Allah to speak the truth. This philosophy says there's no truth. There are truths, lowercase t, plural. Truths. You speak your truth, I'll speak my truth. As if there's, there's my truth and your truth. There's only one truth, an objective truth. So truth is subjective, according to this philosophy. This philosophy, postmodernism, rejects objective morality. They are moral relativists. So this has led many Muslims, young and old, to leave the religion altogether. It's a pandemic of irtidat, of apostasy. They are led to believe that atheism is better for societal well-being than theism. They're led to believe that atheism is better for societal well-being than atheism. There was an 18th century French philosopher, a believer in God. He said it like this, and this is mentioned by, there's a, there's a philosopher named, Jew, uh, a Jewish philosopher named David Berlinsky, and you should get his book. It's called The Devil's Delusion, Atheism and Its Scientific Pretension. This is a robust and sound refutation of Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion. Everyone's heard of Richard Dawkins, the most famous atheist in the world. Everyone's heard his book, The God Delusion. His book has been refuted by David Berlinsky, uh, The Devil's Delusion. So this 18th century French philosopher, he, this is what he said. He said, imagine you had a magic button, a magic button. If you press this button, you'll be given wealth beyond your dreams. But there's a catch. A human being somewhere in the world will fall down dead. It could be your next door neighbor. It could be a civil engineer in Beijing. You have no idea who it's going to be. So he says, who would you entrust this button to? A very devout, God-fearing, Abrahamic theist who believes in the day of judgment, in moral accountability, supernatural accountability, or a very committed atheist who believes in natural selection, survival of the fittest, there's no afterlife, there's no supernatural accountability. Can you imagine if people did not believe in a moral and supernatural accountability? Who would you entrust this button to? We need to advocate a strong return to Abraham. This is what Islam essentially is. It is an Abrahamic, theoethical, Judeo-Christian reform movement at its essence. It is a reformation of Jewish legalism, formalism, and ethnocentrism, and a reformation of Christian theology. Thus, a restoration of the true millah of the great patriarch Ibrahim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the end of Surah Al-Hajj, appropriately titled Surah Al-Hajj, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِهِ Strive in Allah's path as you ought to strive. 
He has chosen you and has imposed no difficulties in the religion. It is the tradition of your patriarch, of your forefather. When you hear postmodern types railing against the evil, evil patriarchy, and we need to smash it and bring it down, who is the patriarch? The patriarch, the ruling father, is Ibrahim alayhi salam. We should know that. Next time you take your gender studies class. The most famous of the postmodern philosophers. This is what he said. And this, this man is a rock star all around the world. He's, he's dead. He died of AIDS. Um, he, le he led a certain lifestyle that caught up with him. So he's been dead for a while. But he said, it is meaningless to speak. Quote, it is meaningless to speak in the name of or against truth, reason, or knowledge. Truth, reason, and knowledge. Aql, or mantiq, haq, and ilm are meaningless. Right? And this is someone who's very, very influential in the Muslim world. He actually taught at the University of Tunis for years in the 1960s. So this philosophy is not just in the West, it's everywhere. Now reason is limited, but is it meaningless? Can we really not know anything? So how many times we find in the Quran Phrases like, afala taqilun, don't they use their intellect? In kuntum taqilun, la'allakum taqilun, use your aql. So Muslim theologians like Ibn Taymiyyah said that aql and naql, reason and revelation, are not in conflict because the proper use of the former will lead to the recognition of the latter. Proper use of reason will lead to the recognition of revelation. Because they come from the same source, people have warped ideas of what the Quran is. People think the Quran is a book of injunctions. Do's and don'ts, prescriptions and proscriptions. There are only 600 ayat or so in the Quran that contain ahkam, legal injunctions. There are over 700 ayat in the Quran that command people to think and use reason and to reflect. Right? It's not the code of Hammurabi. The Quran is completely different than the covenant code of Moses and Exodus. Completely different. Imam al-Ghazali says in the Qistas al-Mustaqim, that the Quran itself appeals to logic through syllogistic arguments. And this is long before any type of Greek or Hellenistic influences upon Muslim theological discourse. The prophets used logic and reason to appeal to their respective communities because logic and reason have efficacy. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to use our brains. And Sayyidina Ibrahim salam is a prime example of this. I'll give you an example. Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in meaning in the Quran, thus did we show Ibrahim alayhi salam the dominion of the heavens and the earth so that he might be among those possessing certitude. He might become from the people of yaqeen. Now the word yaqeen in the Quran, there's another famous ayah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa'bud rabbaka hatta ya'tika al yaqeen. Worship your Lord until certitude comes to you. And almost all of the ulama here, Imam Qurtubi, Tabari, Zamakhshari, Suyuti, you name it, they say that yaqeen here means death. Worship your Lord until death overtakes you, because then you're going to have certainty. But Imam al-Biqa'i, he says, that could be true, but he says, possibly the meaning here is, yaqeen is sapiential, the sapiential station of certitude in this life. It is to experience Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, and to know that there's no God but Allah. This is the meaning here, Wallahu alam, with Ibrahim alayhi salam. When the night grew dark upon Ibrahim, he saw a kawkab, a star. He said, Hada Rabbi, this is my Lord. But when it set, he, uh, uh, but when it set, he said, I love not things that set. Then he saw the moon rising and he said, Hada Rabbi, this is my Lord. But when it set, he said, uh, if my Lord does not guide me, I shall surely be among the people who are astray. But then he saw the sun rising. He said, Hada Rabbi, Hada Akbar. This is my Lord, this is great. Right? But when it's set, he said, Oh my people, I am free of the partners you ascribe. Truly as a Hanif, as a quintessential monotheist, I have turned my face towards him who created the heavens and the earth. Don't get the wrong idea here. What's going on here? This is Ibrahim alayhi salam's rhetorical argument against the idolatry of his people, the ancient Babylonians. 
He is drawing out through intellectual deduction, through reasoning, the flaws of their beliefs. He assents. He says, yes, there's order and predictability in nature. The Greeks call this logos. They say the cosmos, the universe, has logos, has order, predictability. Right? But natural phenomena also changes. It's called tahwil. It's mutable. It sets. Falamma afala. The kokab. Hadarafi. Falamma afala. Falamma afala. The qamar. Falamma afalat. Ashams. It changes. And that which changes cannot be the eternal. Cannot have al qidam al dhati. An essential pre eternality. And if something is not eternal, then it is makhluk. It is created. It came into being. Thus, it cannot be worshipped in its right. This is the argument. This is a sophisticated argument. To say it another way, that which is perfect cannot change. Because a thing either changes for the worse, which is problematic, or it improves. But if it improves, then it could have been better. Therefore, not perfect. So he's, he, he finishes the argument here. Inni wajahdu wajhiya lilladhi fatara samawati wal ard. Indeed, I have turned my face towards the creator of the heavens and the earth. Hanifa, as a quintessential monotheist. Imam al Tabari even says that there's a hint of sarcasm in Ibrahim alayhislam's argument, and that this adds to its rhetorical power, as if to say, Come on, you know better. You know better than worshipping these mutable celestial bodies. Worship the immutable, eternal, supernatural creator. Worship As-Salam. One of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is As-Salam. What does As-Salam mean? The peace? No. Allah is not the peace. As-Salam means the perfect one. This is, this is related to Salim, Salim. As-Salam means the perfect one. One of the names of Allah is Al-Mu'min. What does that mean? He's a believer. Allah is a believer. Al-Mu'min means the one who gives you safety. These names have different meanings when applied to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the perfect one. In another place in the Quran, have you, have you not considered the one who debated with Ibrahim about his Lord because Allah had given him sovereignty? Who is this man debating with Ibrahim alayhi salam about his Lord? According to the Mufassirin, this is a man named Nimrod, Nimrud, the king of Babylon. When Abraham said, my Lord gives life and causes death, he said, Nimrod, his interlocutor he's debating with, I give life and death. And according to the tafsir, Nimrod ordered two slaves to come. And he said, kill this one and release this one. I give life and I cause death. قَالَ Ibrahim, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْتِي بِالشَّمْسِ مِنَ الْمَشْرِقِ فَأْتِي بِهَا مِنَ الْمَغْرِبِ MashaAllah. Ibrahim Islam responded, Truly Allah brings the sun from the east. Bring it then from the west. Thus he who disbelieved was confounded of Puhita. And Allah does not guide a wrongful people. In this debate, Ibrahim salam points out the limitations of human volition, the limitations of human choice, of ikhtiyar insani. Nimrod claimed to be God. In fact, many of the exegetes say that the first human being in all of human history who claimed to be God, who, who claimed to be Allah, was Nimrod. That's why in modern English slang, you call a stupid person, you say, what a Nimrod. You ever heard that before? That guy's a Nimrod. He claimed to be God. The Mufassir also mentioned, Wallahu alam, that a mosquito went up into Nimrod's nose and bit him and there was an infection and it caused so much pain that you know, he, had to, he had to keep slapping his own face just to sort of relieve the pain. And it came to a point where he had his servants beating him over the head with a shoe until they beat him to death. This is what happens when someone claims to be Allah. But here's the point. If Nimrod, and one time I was walking, to, I just remember, I was walking to Arabic class years ago when I was overseas, and Middle Eastern flies have no adab. So this fly was going in my ear and I actually contacted it, and then it went into my other ear. I'm like, wow, why aren't you dead? Why aren't you like on the ground? You go up my nose. And so I got to my class, and I asked my teacher, I said, why did Allah create flies? Why did he create them? And then he went to a book on his shelf, a book of Aqidah, and the ulama talk about it. It's mentioned. And he said, oh, right here, right here. Allah created the fly to, to, 
to taunt and, one, and uh, on, annoy the oppressor. He said, oh, stop. October. Here's the point. If Nimrod is limited in his choices and potential, then he is not perfect. If he is not perfect, then he is ontologically, essentially, inferior to a deity. Therefore, his mulk, that Allah describes as sovereignty, could not have originated with him. It must have been given to him. And atahu Allahu al-mulk. This is exactly what Allah says. Allah gave him this sovereignty. Ibrahim salam demonstrates this quite dramatically by demanding Nimrod to bring the sun from the west. You think you have power over life and death? Let's see you have power over the sun. Of course, this is easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has absolute unrestricted volition within his nature. Allah is omnipotent. He has qudra mutlaq. This is one of the qualitative attributes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Safat al Ma'ani. This is what you study when you study Aqeedah, Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Nimrod can't, Nimrod can't do it. He has no rejoinder in this debate. Upuhita, he is confounded. We are told that Ibrahim alayhi salam destroyed the idols of his people. And the Mufassirin say this happened when Ibrahim was a very young man, a teenager, living in a very populous city called Ur in Chaldea, in ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Iraq. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he said to his people, do you worship that which you carve? Allah created you and your actions. The argument here is, how can something you made be worthy of your worship when it only exists because of you? You are its efficient cause. Thus, you must be greater. Yet Allah made you. Thus, Allah is greater. And since Allah is the only real creator, there can only be one real creator. Or else we're stuck in this intellectually repugnant paradox of infinite regress. You ever heard that, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Why is this a paradox? Because both are made of matter. Therefore, both require time and space. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is spaceless, timeless, and immaterial. This is how infinite regress is solved. So since Allah is the only real creator, and there can be only one, and the efficient cause of all creation, then only he is worth, worthy of worship. And of course, their response to this is, Al-Quhu fil jahim Let's throw him into a fire. Threats violence, ad hominem attacks. This is normal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, and I'm finishing up here, there's an amazing ayah in the Quran that ties this all together. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, ma yartadda minkum an deenihi, fa sofa yati allahu bi qawmin yuhibbuhum wa yuhibbunahu. O you who believe, if you turn renegade, or if you leave the religion, man yartadda minhum, if you engage or enter into a state of irtidad, apostasy, ridda, soon will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring another people. Another people whom he will love and they will love him. Adhillatin ala al-mu'mineen. And now Allah describes them. They are lowly among the believers. A'izzatin ala al-kafirin. They are respected among the disbelievers. Yujahiduna fi sabilillah wa la yakhafuna lawma tala'im. They strive in Allah's path, and they are not afraid of people who reproach them. So the ulama say there are two main reasons for the irtidat. There are two main reasons for the apostasy that we can glean from this one ayah. Number one, lack of love. Because Allah says here that if you turn away, I'll bring another people. Allah will love them. So they have lack of love. If they have lack of love of Allah, that means they don't have ma'rifatullah. Because ma'rifah, gnosis of God, leads to love. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ibrahim alayhi salam is from the muhsinin in the Qur'an. And at least three times in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly says that he loves the muhsinin. Inna allaha yuhibbul muhsinin. The people of ihsan, of spiritual excellence. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, he, de he defined ihsan in the famous Hadith Jibreel, and ta'budallaha ka'annaka tarah. 
to worship Allah as though you see him. So imagine your CEO asked you to make a sales call and then sat in your office as you did it. And he said, put it on speaker. How excellent would that sales call be? <laughs> That's some CEO, some human being. So that's one reason for the irtidat, lack of love. What's the, what's the second reason? Lack of intellectual sophistication. The, the Quran says here, describing these people, They're not afraid of people who reproach them. Why aren't they afraid? Because they are intellectually formidable. They're intellectual warriors. They will engage in dialogue with the reproachers. Bil hikmah. That there are certain hudud, you don't, you don't transgress. Bil hikmah means with wisdom, with dala'il, with proofs, rational proofs, scriptural proofs. Wal mawidatil hasana, with beautiful exhortation. And with, according to the ulama, husnul khuluk, good character. Aristotle says this in the art of persuasion. You have logos, when you try to persuade, use rational proofs, and ethos, you have good disposition. So this is the way of our master Ibrahim salam. This is the way of our master Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Love of God rooted in the knowledge of God. A ma'rifa of Allah that leads to a mahabba, a love of Allah. Mind and heart. Postmodern philosophy rejects revelation and distrusts human intellect. So naql and aql, both of them are out. This is the dominant prevailing epistemology in colleges and universities. There's no naql and you can't trust aql. Wallahi, this philosophy is satanic. I mean, what's the conclusion of this philosophy? There's no God, so no revelation, and reason can't get you to absolute truth. There is no absolute truth. So just follow your hawa. Just do you. This is what they say. Just get yours. Get it. Right? There's a philosophy called voluntarism. This is when the will, the hawa, takes primacy over the intellect. The intellect's job is to keep the will in check. The word aqal in Arabic means to hobble something. And iqal in Arabic is a cord you use to tie your camel down so it doesn't run away. But when the hawa and the nafs are doing whatever they want, do what thou wilt, this is the mantra of Satan. This is the, in the book of Crowley, Viver Legis, the book of the law of Satan. He says, do whatever you want. This is the whole law of man. This is what's happening. So, it's exactly 7.30. So I have to stop. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our ad'iya on this blessed day. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, uh, inshallah ta'ala, will for us to go to Hajj, if we haven't been, to go again, or to be with the Hajjaj in spirit. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fortify our faith and to make us exemplars of the mankind, to make us follow, have ittiba of the footsteps of Ibrahim alayhi uh, salam, and, 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 and follow the footsteps of the one who perfected the millah of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. I mean, all of these things people do at Hajj, all of these things are tied to Ibrahim alayhi salam. You know, Safa and Marwa, right? Lady Hajira, she ran between the, you know, and then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered his, uh, gave that dream to Ibrahim alayhi salam, shaitan would come and he'd say, what did he order you to do? What? Are you kidding me? And then Ibrahim picked up some pebbles and threw them at the shaitan. This is the origin of the Jamara. Uh, Imam al-Razi, he says that, he says that, because the Quran says, Qad sadaqta ru'ya. That Allah says to Ibrahim that you have fulfilled your vision and he hadn't killed his son. So Imam al-Razi says that by demonstrating complete obedience to God, Ibrahim alayhi salam was true to his vision. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately wanted, a willingness to obey, not the actual slaughter of Abraham's son. That was a clearly a test. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want the blood of his son. Oh, it's interesting. Uh, anyway, I don't want to get into that. Allah khairan.